Today I want to bring special attention to one of the most commonly treated neurosurgical conditions worldwide, hydrocephalus, or also known as water on the brain. Yesterday I presented the case of a seven-month-old baby who was brought into their pediatrician for a routine checkup and it was found that the baby's head circumference was continuing to enlarge. A CAT scan of the baby's head was performed that revealed markedly enlarged ventricles or a fluid-filled space of the brain and a normal-sized fourth ventricle. This baby has congenital hydrocephalus caused by aqueductal stenosis. Aqua what? September is Hydrocephalus Awareness Month and hydrocephalus is one of the most commonly treated neurosurgical conditions. I've spent the last two weeks discussing normal pressure hydrocephalus as well as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, other causes of hydrocephalus. So today I wanna to focus on congenital hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus that presents at birth. Hydrocephalus can happen at any age and has many causes. In the United States, the rate of congenital hydrocephalus is one to two in every 1,000 births. But in other countries such as Africa, the rate is almost double that. Untreated hydrocephalus has a high mortality rate from anywhere 20 to 87%. And unfortunately in countries with poor access to healthcare, we can see this. Let's talk about how this happens. You guys have probably all heard of spinal fluid. So let's talk about what that is and where it's made in the brain. CSF or cerebral spinal fluid is produced in the choroid plexus of the brain and it's a fluid that bathes the brain. It's there to help deliver nutrients to the brain tissue as well as remove toxins or waste. It also helps with homeostasis and temperature regulation and it also acts as a shock absorber. You see our brain floats around in our skull and it's surrounded by that CSF to allow cushioning and buoyancy for it to float around. So if you get hit in the head, it'll provide a protection or absorb some of the shock of that impact. The clear, watery type of fluid that's made in the choroid plexus or this red thing in the brain. It filters the plasma in the blood to produce this fluid. As it's produced, it circulates through the ventricles or those spaces in the brain where CSF lies. Here's a cartoon illustration of where those chambers in the brain are located. We have the lateral ventricles of the brain, which are the biggest part of the fluid space of the brain, the third ventricle, which lies dead center of the brain that travels through a small area called the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle of the brain. And from there, it drains through our brainstem and goes into the spinal canal near our spinal cord. It circulates around the whole brain called the subarachnoid space and then filters back up and is absorbed through these other areas in our brain called the arachnoid granulations. This sounds very complicated. Let me simplify it a little bit. These things create the fluid, it bathes the whole brain, circulates around, and it is then reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. So it's pretty much like a plumbing system. What goes in must come out, and if there's any obstruction along the way, it can have abnormal circulation and cause problems. It may not even be an obstruction. You can even have abnormalities in the fluid itself that can make it too thick, or you can have problems with the reabsorption process or even where too much is produced. So there's many different things that can go wrong to produce hydrocephalus. The difference between how hydrocephalus presents in babies versus adults has to do with the structure of our skull. In babies, their skull isn't fully formed. So as they grow, their head can get bigger over time and they have spots that are called fontanelles or soft spots, which I'm sure you've heard of. And that's why we measure head circumference at pediatric visits to ensure that the head is developing properly. So if the head is getting bigger, it may be a sign of a problem. That's why hydrocephalus in babies can look like this because their skull can expand with that increasing fluid. In adults, you won't see this because the skull is fully fused and an increase of pressure will cause symptoms without an expansion of the head. So what are those symptoms in kids? Extreme cases, you can see massively enlarged skulls you can see a prominent vasculature that's visible on the scalp. You can see thinning of the skin because the head is rapidly expanding. And you can also see what's called sunsetting, where the eyes will look like they're looking down. It's because their upward gaze or their ability to look up is compromised because of that pressure inside of the brain. Other more common signs and more earlier presenting cases are lethargy or the baby's just sleeping a little bit more than normal. 
nausea and vomiting like the baby spitting up more, fullness of the fontanelle where that soft spot feels a little bit more firm than normal, enlargement of the head like I mentioned in our baby's case, or fussiness and irritability. So if you have clinical signs, imaging is warranted to help us look at the brain to figure out why the baby may be developing hydrocephalus. CT and MRI are common imaging modalities, but CTs are often used more frequently because they're less costly and easier to perform. MRIs in babies are a little bit more time consuming and typically the baby would have to have anesthesia because of the duration of the imaging. What we're looking at is trying to identify the cause and to rule out something like a lesion or a brain tumor that may be present that we could remove to correct the hydrocephalus. What we see on our baby's CAT scan is markedly enlarged lateral ventricles and the third ventricle, but the fourth ventricle is pretty normal sized. What that tells us clinically is that there may be an obstruction between the communication of the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. And remember earlier, I told you that that anatomical landmark is called the cerebral aqueduct. You can develop aqueductal stenosis congenitally or at birth or even later in adulthood. So that communication channel can become obstructed small or even get webbing or little scar tissue within the ventricle itself, allowing the miscommunication of fluid. Does that make sense? Basically, there is blockage in that area and we need to unblock it. Treating hydrocephalus is a little bit like a plumbing lesson. Yes, in neurosurgery, we are glorified plumbers sometimes. The most common treatment for hydrocephalus is something called a ventricular peritoneal shunt, where we'll take a drain tube, place it into the ventricle, connected to a valve which will detect the pressure and then drain the CSF or spinal fluid all the way into the abdominal cavity. It doesn't always have to go into the abdomen. There are ventricular atrial shunts where we can shunt the fluid into the heart or ventricular pleural shunts where we'll drain it into the pleural cavity. Shunts are an extremely common way of diverting spinal fluid because it's a tubing system, it can become obstructed and stop working. In fact, a meta-analysis of shunts show that 32% of them can fail over two years. And if that happens, you know what that means, another surgery. And that's why we have hydrocephalus patients lifelong because they may have to undergo many, many procedures over their lifetime for failed shunts. So any type of option that we can present besides the shunt is something that we need to consider. So let's talk about that. And this patient with congenital aqueductal stenosis or narrowing right here, we may can divert that fluid through this pathway and that is through the floor of the third ventricle. So the natural flow of spinal fluid is down this way, but if we can make a space right here, we might can divert the fluid this way without having to place a shunt. And that procedure is called an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Normally this area in the brain is closed, but if we can surgically make a hole in the floor of the third ventricle, we can make spinal fluid go through an alternate pathway and not have to place hardware into the brain. Here is how we do that, and we call it an ETV or an endoscopic third ventriculostomy because we can make a small incision on the patient's skull, place an endoscope or a camera, and then place a hole right here through the floor of the third ventricle to open that space in front of the brainstem. In an experienced surgeon's hands, this is a very safe procedure and here is what you can visualize through the endoscope. Here you can see the floor of the third ventricle. We place a balloon through that floor. It's a thin, thin membrane that will then open up a hole into the third ventricle and allow fluid to flow. And there's even studies that show that this procedure can be successful in cases outside of aqueductal stenosis, like even in normal pressure hydrocephalus. I've been talking a long time, so back to our case. That baby was referred to a pediatric neurosurgeon. She underwent an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, so no shunt was placed, and she did great. She went on to having complete resolution of her developmental delay, reduction back to normal of her head size and shape, and never required a shunt procedure. She's now a normal, active, 15-year-old child. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week, and I'll go through another case.